Um, Dave Olson, our friend, who's always so, such a big part of this, says, uh, SpaceX has now landed three rockets on a barge at sea. Will they continue to increase their index of human awesomeness, or will we become complacent when they keep sticking the landings? And the reason I wanted to take that question, Dave, is that when we become complacent, that's when we win. Uh, we're no longer amazed that an airliner lands safely. Uh, we're amazed when an airliner doesn't land safely. We're astonished and shocked. Uh, people who are afraid of flying, uh, we haven't had a fatal accident on a major carrier in 15 years. It'll be 15 years in September. 15 years of 30,000, 40,000 flights a day and not a single crash of, a, of, a, of an American carrier with, a, you know, with an actual jet. We had one. It happened right after September 11th. It was a, the, the American Airlines crash DC, uh, in Airbus crashed in New York, and that was the clock reset. And since then, it's been almost 15 years, and we haven't had a single fatality on a major um, airliner. We came pretty damn close um, when uh, Captain Sullenberger lost both engines climbing out of um, LaGuardia. But, you know, coolness under pressure and training, courage, competence, and skill meant that that record is still holding because he got every single one of them out of there. Uh, and that's all that really matters. So um, when when the extraordinary becomes commonplace and boring, Dave, that's when you've succeeded. Uh, when, I mean, air travel used to be unspeakably dangerous. And if you read uh, Fate is the Hunter, um, it was about the very first days of commercial aviation right after World War II. You'd find out these guys were losing an airplane a week. They'd lose a crew and the people on board a week. Uh, where is Johnson and Edwards? Uh, they flew into a mountain in, in Montreal. Oh, okay. What happened to these guys? Well, they were killed. It uh, looks like a rudder, um, you know, departed the airplane over the South Pacific. Okay. Um, we learn, they say uh, federal aviation regulations are written in blood. It's really true. Uh, you know, we, if, if the best you can hope for, I think, I think certainly the case with the Virgin uh, crash, the Virgin um, uh, America Spaceship Two crash, you, it's, to me, it's unreasonable that you will not make mistakes and kill people. I think there's a minimum cost of lives that has to be paid because if you're doing something new, you're making mistakes that no one's made before, and you won't know what they are until you make them. And some of them you'll get lucky on, and some of them you won't. And the only thing that's unforgivable in, a, in an environment like that is to make the same mistake twice. That's, that's paying extra. Now you're, now you're adding interest um, to, to, to the bill, uh, and you're making unforced errors. You can't really go up and make the same mistake twice. You have to go up and make a new mistake now. Um, one of the things they say in, uh, one of the things my flight instructor said to me real early was, uh, uh, Bill, you know, um, learn from other people's mistakes because you're not going to live long enough to make them all yourself. That's right. I read accident reports and I say, oh, I shouldn't have done this. And I was up there over the mountains last uh, couple nights ago in a single engine airplane in the dark. I was thinking I should not have put myself in this situation. And I don't think I'll put myself in that situation again. But at the same time, I was thinking, I did know that this was a possibility, and I did think that this was well within my capabilities, and it is well within my capabilities, so, you know, it was memorable, and uh, and I had to focus, but it was, I don't think it was ever dangerous. I don't, certainly, I wasn't ever in a space of, like, my God, what's going to happen? It was just, all right, just keep it under control and don't hit anything. Um, so, the I think, actually, Dave, the problem is simply that we're, that we're going so slowly um, that... Uh, we're trying to avoid paying the price at all. And therefore, we're not only going to pay the price, but we're not going to get what we want. We're not going to get what we're paying for. Progress costs lives. And and there are people who do the flying who are fully prepared to take that risk. They were prepared to take that risk in the 60s. They're prepared to take that risk in the in the dawn of aviation. You know, most of those guys who, who went up in those crates were killed. Uh, Orville Wright was very nearly killed. He has a terrible crash. He, took, he never really fully recovered, but they're prepared to take the risk. It's not a suicide mission, but it's dangerous. I forget what the number of original um, male pilots, when they first started flying male in the late 20s and 30s, they're flying in sleet. There's no navigational systems. They're literally looking, they're literally flying underneath the scud levels 200 feet above the ground, trying to read the name of the town off of the water tower. And these guys were losing one out of every four guys, you know, and I understand that during the golden age of test flight out in Edwards Air Force Base, the chance of a test pilot coming back from a mission was was 75 percent he had a 25 percent chance of not coming home every time he went up you run those odds it's 
it's murder. Um, but we don't make the mistakes that we made then. We, we made new mistakes. And with civil aviation, as far as civil, uh, civil aviation is concerned, the fact that we've gone 15 years without a fatality is an indication that we have about run out of mistakes. That's not to say we won't find something new. We will. But we have certainly made all of the common mistakes, and we've made most of the outlying mistakes, and we've also understood how mistakes are made. Some of the procedures that they put into place in um, commercial aviation cockpits have since been moved into the, into the uh, operating room by pilots who happen to be doctors because uh, one of the things, this is a perfect example actually, one of the things that, um, one of these regulations written in blood is the idea of a sterile cockpit. And what that means is it is now against uh, FAA regulations, kind of a nice tie into earlier, for a commercial crew, a pilot and co-pilot, it is against regulations, and they can lose their license over this, to talk about anything other than the flying at hand during critical flight phases like uh, taxi out, take off, landing, and so on. If Because looking at the black boxes and listening to the voice recorders, we found out that entire airplanes full of people, 140 people, died because the pilot and the co-pilot were talking about a date that he was about to have, and they were so into that aspect of it that they forgot to set the flaps for takeoff or something like that. So now um, you're not allowed to do that anymore. Now the only conversation that's allowed during these critical flight phases is conversation directly related to the flight. That's a, that has saved lots of people, lots of people. That mistake not only did we not have to make again, but we basically eliminated any number of upcoming mistakes because of things like that. And when they take it to the to the le- uh, to the operating room, things like checklists, things like um, having to get verbal confirmation from other team members, then you find out that the number of errors in the surgical uh, uh, wards goes way, way down, and way down. You're not amputating the wrong leg anymore because now you've got a co-pilot surgeon who says, we're going to confirm now on our checklist that we are in fact going to amputate the right leg. And he says, well, I'm kind of prepping the left leg. Well, we got a little problem here, sir. It works. So, um, and it works because we paid for it. It worked because because we found out why people died when we didn't do it that way. And as I say, we're running out of we're running out of errors in commercial aviation. We're now at the point where 15 years of uh, of an unbroken safety record is telling me that uh, we've gotten all the demons pretty much wrung out of the system. Nothing is really going to come at us as just like what? I don't think. And that's not to say we won't have mistakes, but we'll have mistakes that will be shouldn't have done that as opposed to what the hell happened. By the way, they say um, they say that if you're if you killed as a pilot and you go to the pearly gates, there's one of two answers that you're going to get, or questions rather, that you're going to get from St. Peter, and one of them is okay and the other one's not. If you um, if you get up to the to the pearly gates after you've been killed in a plane crash and St. Peter says to you, hey, tough break, kid, then okay. You got hit by a meteorite or, or, or a, a, an elevator fell off or some part failed that we didn't know before. Tough break, kid. You know, sorry it had to be you, but, you know, dems the brakes. On the other hand, if he says, what were you thinking? That's a whole different animal. You should have known better, and you did know better, and you did it anyway. That's just stupidity as opposed to bad luck. Anyway, 